You remember this little kid from House of the Dragon? Willem Blackwood. He is a badass that took his bully and put him into the dirt. But there's a lot more to him and his heroism in this moment than meets the eye in House of the Dragon. This little guy showed up to try and marry a Targaryen princess, drew swords on a Bracken bully, put that Bracken in the dirt, and then walked away like the hero of legend we all know he is. Wait, what's that? I'm being told his name is Gerald Bracken. Okay, well, he may have had that one coming under the laws of silly named characters dying very quickly. Willem also established the secret house words of House Blackwood never known before to anybody. Fuck around and find out. Honestly, it's surprising that Rhaenyra didn't marry Willem Blackwood on the spot. As I said, I think the scene has a lot more going on than many are giving credit for. It's not just fan service for obsessive book fans or a moment to cheer for David slaying Goliath. It's being used to foreshadow important events. Tell us more about potentially huge character flaws in Rhaenyra and show us how small moments like these can be the butterfly wing flaps that become tsunamis in years to come. As I said on the surface, this feels a bit like fan service. The showrunners throwing a bone to Riverlands enthusiasts and book nerds who are awaiting the Blackwoods and Brackens to make their entrance onto the show. Maybe something they just made up to give book fans a thrill to see their favorite Blackwoods, but this duel is something from Fire and Blood we know about, or at least something like it. In Fire and Blood, we are told when Princess Rhaenyra was trying to find a husband all across Westeros, during one of the tourneys, a duel broke out between Samuel Blackwood and Amos Bracken over Rhaenyra's hand. A major difference though, in Fire and Blood, Samuel Blackwood loses the duel to Amos Bracken and no one dies. If I had to guess, this is most likely why the characters were swapped here with Willem for Samuel and Gerald for Amos as Samuel and Amos end up being named characters later in the coming seasons. Samuel gutting Amos now at this cattle show with suitors would screw up the future plans of the show quite a bit. And in that sense, yes, this scene with Willem Blackwood is a bit of fan service. The Blackwoods are far more popular in the wider Song of Ice and Fire fandom than the Brackens are, who share the same reputation as the dreaded Freys and Boltons. The duel results are also flipped so that the David-like Blackwoods can get a moral victory over the loudmouth Goliath of Bracken. You know, we're all fist pumping and cheering that little nerdling for getting his victory against his bully, especially celebrating the bravery of young Willem to not take the abuse and draw his sword on Gerald despite being severely outmatched. And the biggest surprise of all that Willem Blackwood somehow gets the better of Gerald Bracken and guts the bigger boy who dies sputtering blood in presumably his father's arms. Get absolutely wrecked Bracken. And that's kind of the fan service element. Gerald should have won, but the show decided to give the Blackwoods a win to give them a great first impression to new viewers. And especially for primarily show fans who probably have no idea who these houses are after they were largely omitted from Game of Thrones, they'll now have a positive association the next time the Blackwoods show up on screen. However, this is just the very beginning of the story of the Blackwoods and Brackens for the audience in House of the Dragon. The two houses have the single most astounding feud in history of wars against each other more than any other houses in all of the Seven Kingdoms. As I detailed here in a series of very normal streams about the Blackwoods that wasn't crazy, they have for thousands of years found themselves in wars large and small against each other over and over and over. These also aren't just two random bumpkin houses out in the Riverlands firing arrows at each other that no one cares about. The Blackwoods and the Brackens are the two powerhouses of the Riverlands with large and valuable holdings, immense social credibility, and huge armies to their names. At different times in history, each of them were kings of the rivers and hills. Any conquest of the region has gone through them. A very common strategy for would-be conquerors of the Riverlands would be rather than fighting both houses, they'd ally with one to fight against the other, taking advantage of this feud. And the feud is over the most petty and small things you can imagine. Their lands sit on either side of the Red Fork of the River Trident, and their wars are over the same hills, mills, valleys, and small towns they traded back and forth over the centuries numerous times. 5,000 years ago, somebody was king and somebody wasn't, and somebody stole a horse, and somebody ran off with a daughter, and it all just weaves into this long-standing feud between the two of them that no one can even remember what it's about. But it is so ingrained in the culture of each family that any small event can reignite the flames of war so fast they've tried so many times to tame. And 
They really have. For as many wars as the Blackwoods and Brackens have fought, they have made as many marriage pacts and pieces to end it. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the young Hoster Blackwood says as much to Jamie Lannister, who is currently trying to forge another peace between the two houses. We've had a hundred pieces with the Brackens, many sealed marriages. There's Blackwood blood in every Bracken, and Bracken blood in every Blackwood. The old king's peace lasted half a century, but then some fresh quarrel broke out, and the old wounds opened and began to bleed again. That's how it always happens, my father says. So long as men remember the wrongs done to their forebears, no peace will ever last. So we go on, century after century, with us hating the Brackens and them hating us. My father says there'll never be an end to it. And this is kind of what I'm getting at with this moment between the two boys wearing their family crest dueling over a princess and one ending up dead is really not just a fist pump moment to cheer for Willem. Willem instantly starts to vomit in the background. He never meant to kill Jarrah at all. And now at a very young age, he's watching another person dead by his own hand. And we see that from the other side as well. Gerald's father hunched over his son's mangled body, sobbing as his boy draws his last breath in this world. The reality of it really transcends the squabbles of their ancestors, all of them long dead, and how it's a tragedy that because of some random insults, Gerald Bracken is now dead, and it's Willem Blackwood who killed him. Even though the camera of the show and Rhaenyra leave, the Bracken and Blackwood delegations are all going to go back home and now they have to deal with the reality and fallout of Gerald's death. Each one of them with their own stories about what really happened. The cruel Bracken picking on a small child in an accident that got totally out of hand. Maybe justice for generations of aggressions from the brutal Brackens. Or on the other side, a few innocent jokes that the overly sensitive Blackwood took murderous offense to and showed the true colors of House Blackwood as bloodthirsty killers. You can be sure that Lord Bracken may feel like he has to defend the honor of their house by, I don't know, staging attacks on Blackwood lands in Gerald's name. And then of course, Lord Blackwood having to retaliate, eventually the matter ending up before their liege lord in the Tullys. Maybe one of the mills or hills or valleys is given back to the Brackens as compensation, and the wounds of their feud, which had scabbed over the last hundred years or so, are ripped open again. That's right, even though they've been at war countless times, largely due to them getting new overlords in the Tullys and Targaryens, the blood feud had gone dormant. With this duel between Willem and Gerald, it's been fed blood again. We have not seen the last of these two. Another thing this whole incident tells us as viewers is actually quite a lot about Rhaenyra and how she may perform as the future monarch of Westeros. The scene opens and we see a bored and annoyed Rhaenyra sitting in the high seat of Storm's End, the home of House Baratheon. Lord Borman Baratheon, who we previously saw praising his cousin Rhaenys Targaryen as the queen who never was, and then unhappily swearing to Rhaenyra as his future monarch, is now sitting next to Rhaenyra with a strained look on his face. And it becomes quickly apparent why. Rhaenyra isn't taking the search for suitors seriously, and isn't really bothering to hide it. Lord Dondarrion, a very old man, is making his pitch for the princess, which is, you know, a bit of a long shot. Rhaenyra is really looking for two things that King Viserys impressed on her when he said she should go out and find a husband of her choice. Someone who makes her happy, and also someone powerful enough to secure her ascension to the Iron Throne. Lord Dondarrion is neither. With their family being relatively anonymous as far as houses go, lacking in strength or wealth, mostly making their name for being Marcher Lords, defending the Stormlands against the not quite in the Seven Kingdoms yet Dornish. And Lord Dondarrion is currently boring and annoying the princess. So two strikes and he's out. However, the way she does it is as Lord Baratheon says, <laughs> That was unseen. And Borman's not wrong. Rhaenyra is more focused here on making the assembled gallery laugh by playing insult comic against the very same lords who are there to ask for the opportunity to take her hand in marriage. She finds the whole scenario patently ridiculous and wants to end the farce immediately. The problem here being that Rhaenyra is specifically looking for a husband that will defend her right to the Iron Throne. And there is no one lord that can do that in all of Westeros. She's going to need the support of many lords, large and small, to form a greater alliance that will defend her when called upon. And you know who won't be psyched to be called upon to die for Queen Rhaenyra? These very same lords that she's currently stunting on to make a few people laugh. Houses like the Dondarians went on their own, make or break any war, but enough houses of their side who hold a grudge against the future queen for her rude dismissals could be enough to turn the tide of support. 
These lords are drama queens after all. Don't forget as well, this was no small or cheap task for most of these nobles to make the long journey across Westeros just for the chance to have a few minutes to charm Rhaenyra. With her dismissals, probably feels like a totally wasted effort. Never mind Lord Bormund and his family who are watching Rhaenyra insult their vassals and potential allies one after another. The Baratheon family are blood of the dragon, allegedly. Descended from Oris Baratheon, the supposed half-brother to Aegon the Conqueror and Aegon's first Hand of the King. The Baratheon conquest of the Stormlands from House Durandon has made the Baratheons one of the Targaryen's key allies for keeping their conquest intact. The threat of the Storm Lords marching under the banner of the three-headed dragon has largely kept the conquered kingdoms in line along with the threat of Dragonfire. Between the Targaryens, the Valarians, the Baratheons, and kind of the Seljigars, the Iron Throne has used these Valyrian houses in Westeros as their core defensive alliance. Losing the Baratheon's support in any way would be a huge loss to any monarch trying to hold onto the Iron Throne. And let me tell you, Lord Bormund was none too pleased about the prospect of Rhaenyra as his liege even before he knew her well, and he's distinctly less impressed after seeing her antics in his hall. Rhaenyra here also personally causes the conflict between the Brackens and Blackwoods to potentially reignite. Let me explain. Despite our reaction to Willem Blackwood's bravery and victory, Rhaenyra is neither an impressed nor happy to see the boy. After Lord Dondarrion, Willem steps up to make his plea, and before a word can even get out of his mouth, Rhaenyra mocks Willem for his age. She shakes her head in disbelief at him, remarking to the court at large how he's only a child and how she thinks it is absurd that he's even here. While true and an understandable reaction, Rhaenyra probably shouldn't be saying this to the entire court and especially to Willem's face. Despite his many faults, even King Viserys didn't laugh in Lena's face. Lord Borman then tries to save the scenario by explaining as I have the strategic value the Blackwood name and army's command, temporarily getting Rhaenyra to cool her reaction and allowing Willem to continue his pitch. It's important to note that it doesn't reflect well on Rhaenyra either that she has to be reminded of the significant political and military power by Lord Baratheon that the Blackwoods command. Although they will not be her direct vassal in the future, they make up a large part of the Riverlander armies and political will that she will hope to command. This is exactly the kind of house that Rhaenyra should recognize and be on her best behavior towards. But you know who picked up on the fact that Rhaenyra thinks it's great fun to make fun of Willem Blackwood? Gerald Bracken. From the crowd, he realizes that if he also insults the boy, Rhaenyra might find it entertaining and possibly increase his chances at winning her hand. Something that proves correct with Rhaenyra later saying, I'm gonna have to like that one. Gerald seizes on the opportunity and insults the younger Blackwood. He roasts Willem for his house not having a big part of Aegon's conquest. Something that's actually incorrect, they were a key part in fighting Hair in the Black. And also for Willem's claim that he will protect Rhaenyra saying that she has a dragon. Maybe Gerald pipes up anyway out of animosity towards the Blackwoods, but he is for sure being egged on by Rhaenyra's comments and her tacit approval as she smiles and laughs at his jokes. To make this point, imagine the scenario is rewound and done again, that instead of Rhaenyra openly mocking Willem, she instead graciously humors the boy who is showing bravery and character to have made the journey all the way to Storm's End to marry a princess, commends Willem, encourages him through his stumbled speech. And where Gerald speaks up to insult Willem, it's not Lord Baratheon who tells him to shut up, but the future monarch of the Seven Kingdoms. Gerald and the Brackens are here for only one reason, Rhaenyra. If she shows disapproval or outright admonishes him for his bad behavior, that would lose them whatever faint hope they had at Rhaenyra's hand, shutting them up. Lord Baratheon does try to do this for Rhaenyra, but his words carry no weight or influence over these river lords. The Baratheons are not their liege lord, and it's not his daughter they're trying to marry, so they don't listen. Listen. In this way, Rhaenyra is wielding her power as heir poorly and unwisely. By showing that she can be amused by the gallery shouting insults, she's encouraging them to do so. In the same way, if she expressed the love of men doing elaborate dances and serving her roasted goose, you can be sure each suitor would be doing their best to serve her a freshly roasted goose from the kitchens while also trying to cut a rug in front of her. That she's letting this happen, as Lord Baratheon notes, is unseemly, and also shows that she currently lacks the social graces and political skill a successful monarch should have. This also came up in episode 3 when Rhaenyra insulted Lady Redwine for her comments about the Stepstones and 
dropped Lord Jason Lannister like a bad habit after his marriage proposal. The Red Wines are a potentially important ally as they command a giant fleet and have an insane amount of wealth out of the arbor in the reach, right next to the high towers. And the Lannisters command obviously all the resources of Cashley Rock and the Westerlands. Those are potentially very important allies for Rhaenyra to maintain at least a cordial relationship with if she ever wants their support if her claim is challenged like it looks it will be. For many of these lords, however, her behavior will remind them much less of old King Jaehaerys or good Queen Alysanne and a lot more of her chaotic uncle Daemon. This is a drumbeat the show has been playing quite often, showing us just how much in common Daemon and Rhaenyra have in their character and tempers. Rhaenyra getting a reputation as being Daemon-like will not help her, and this doesn't really get better for Rhaenyra as we look at her character as a future ruler. As Willem draws his sword after being called Craven, Gerald draws right back and they close in the cross swords. Lord Baratheon initially looks to Rhaenyra to do something, and when she doesn't, he then shouts for the boys to put away their steel and to stop being drama queens. Rhaenyra's reaction is instead to tell Lord Baratheon that they're leaving, while she hustles out of the hall with Sir Criston. Again, an example of wielding her power and influence poorly. Rhaenyra leaves the duel she helps start in a hurry instead of trying in any way to stop it or defuse the situation. Of course, I don't mean that she has to personally jump between the two boys and tell them to stop. She's a princess. She has four fully armed and armored guards, never mind the King's Guard Knight Sir Kristen Cole at her side ready for combat. Any of those men at her command, or most of them in the hall, would have separated the Blackwoods and Brackens if she commanded it. Even Kristen seems a little bit miffed to be walking away while the two boys hack at each other, looking over his shoulder like maybe he should do something. This of course is a callback to a previous duel that we saw in Game of Thrones, the one that breaks out between the Clegane brothers, the very first Clegane Bowl get hype, during the hands tourney for Ned Stark. It's a duel that happens over something equally stupid. Gregor loses a joust to Loras Tyrell and is trying to kill the Knight of Flowers. Sandor steps in and before the duel can really get too far, King Robert stirs himself from his throne and commands the largest men in the Seven Kingdoms to stop dead. And you know what? They do. And Robert isn't even a good king, but he knows how to command respect and obedience when he needs to. Rhaenyra here has a microcosm of that scenario with so much smaller stakes. Instead of two muscle-bound warriors, it's two teenagers who barely know what they're doing with their weapons. And faced with the same scenario, she doesn't do even the bare minimum that Robert does by using her royal authority and respect to command the fight to stop. Keep in mind as well that in this duel between Willem and Gerald, Gerald's roughly twice Willem's size. Anyone watching this breakout would assume Willem was about to get his ass kicked, which is of course part of the reason we as fans then cheered for him. It was totally unexpected that he would win against the much larger Bracken, a triumph against long odds. Rhaenyra would know this though, and she totally abandons the overmatched Willem Blackwood to get his ass kicked for defending his honor that she encouraged to be insulted really doesn't reflect well on her. She's not recognizing she accidentally created a mess, nor is she really trying to fix it. She's just leaving to go get dinner. She wipes her hands clean and leaves the dueling bags of hormones to figure it out. It's not hard to imagine that her future vassals about hearing of this incident may extrapolate out that she may not care about them, nor step in to use the power of the throne to protect them either when she is their only hope for justice. The reality of it all then hits Rhaenyra as Gerald's dying body hits the floor. She is shocked that the duel has turned deadly and it should be a real learning moment for her that her actions are not neutral. Despite her feeling like a bystander in the Red Keep and marginalized by her father, the rest of the realm takes what she says and does extremely seriously. They will hang on every single word she says for the rest of her life, hyper-analyze every decision and move that she makes, hoping to somehow get an advantage. A careless dismissal of one lord could cause wars and conflicts to erupt down the line. The blood of Gerald Bracken should be that lesson of how being heir is less about the perks of being a ruler, but the hard work and service it takes to even be competent at it. A lesson that Rhaenyra doesn't seem to have learned by episode 5 as she challenges Daemon in full view of the court to kill everybody, take her away, and marry her, spurning the Valarians. Of course, it is not her fault that these lessons haven't been taught to her. Much of that falls on her father, King Viserys. Instead of focusing on Rhaenyra's education and grooming her to rule, involving her in major decisions, making sure that she can see the whole political board, teaching her the social 
social skills of ruling, Viserys has largely ignored his chosen heir. She remained a cupbearer to the king for quite a long time and was chastised for speaking up and then acting on her own to solve the problems with Daemon on Dragonstone without a drop of blood. After she resisted Viserys' plans to marry her off, we can see that the king and the princess largely ignore each other. And at some level, we know this is because Viserys believes in his dream, that he was seeing his son succeed him to the Iron Throne, not his daughter. This belief contributing to Viserys not even bothering to prepare Rhaenyra for rule, and mostly being apathetic to her future beyond being a political piece that can be sold for an advantage. These last few years were squandered, and they could have been used making sure Rhaenyra knows her future subjects, their histories, how to behave as a ruler, and how to defuse these tense situations. In Instead, she was abandoned to sit in the godswood like she was in timeout. Long story short, that Rhaenyra is unskilled at knowing how to deal with her potential vassals and ease tensions at court is really a byproduct of neglect from Viserys. Now, some people have a natural talent for it, but these are things that can be taught. And one more thing in Rhaenyra's defense, the situation is absurd. She's being given a few minutes at most to get to know lords of all ages and prestige like some kind of medieval speed dating scenario. It is as insane for her to consider a man as old as her grandfather and a child in Wilm Blackwood as it was for Viserys to consider the 12 year old Lane of Larian. And more than that, the fate of the realm should not hang in the balance while an 18 year old goes through the common human experience of finding a partner for the rest of her life. Yeah, Yes, she is the blood of the dragon and the conqueror, a future monarch, but she's also just a person with unfathomable pressure and expectation on her because of the circumstances of her birth. Rhaenyra is right, it is unfair and ridiculous she's going through this. The burdens of being a monarch are unfair, and they severely restrict the life of the head the crown sits on for duty to the realm. But maybe, maybe the time to express that feeling is not right here, right now in the faces of her vassals. Her future depends on how they will feel about her with a looming succession crisis that might be challenged. It's fine to feel that way, it is bad form to show it now. This whole sequence is honestly very similar to Damon, where he spoke truth to Viserys about how a small council or leech is bleeding him dry and they take advantage of how he is a weak king. Much in the same way, those things are true, but when Viserys is currently furious at you for supposedly celebrating the death of his infant son, not the best time. In the words of the dude to Walter, You're not wrong. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. Okay, then. And now we get back to our boy Willem Blackwood. What does the future hold for the Bracken Slayer? We can try and look to the fire and blood. In that story, his doppelganger Samuel Blackwood eventually ascends to the lordship of Raven Tree Hall, while his nemesis Amos Bracken does the same in Stonehenge. The two men continue to play out the rivalry they started as boys in the years to come. Now, unless the show has for some reason decided that they are swapping out Samuel Blackwood for Willem, that's probably not going to happen. The lordship of the house Blackwood should stay Samuel's and not fall to Willem. For Willem personally though, there will be aftershocks of an extremely traumatic experience in killing another person that just won't go away. That the person he killed is a Bracken, his family's enemy, probably won't ease those feelings of horror at what he did, especially for someone that young. Back in Raven Tree Hall, presumably Willem will get a lot of pats on the back and Westerosi high fives. Side note, do they high five? Is it like a high seven? Do they rub noses? I don't really know. Let me know in the comments. He'll probably be treated like a hero for his courage and his skill, although he probably won't feel like it. While they will think of his triumph as a victory over the hated Brackens, he's going to remember Gerald the boy grasping for air, gushing blood onto the floor, and his father crying for help. And this is the really cruel nature of the honor culture and war machine that Westeros is built on. As unfair as it is for Rhaenyra to have one of the most important choices in a person's life and who to love taken away from her as service to the realm, it is also unfair for Willem Blackwood that he has had his childhood stolen. For the sake of a feud that existed thousands of years before he was a twinkle in his parents' eye, that kid had a sword put on his belt, the colors of his house draped on him, and shipped out to try and convince a princess he has never met before that she should choose him out of all the lords and nobles in the realm for the sake of his house. It's an impossible ask and a deeply unfair one. 
Willem shouldn't be having to draw a sword on a bully or stumble through a marriage proposal he has no choice in making. He should be running through Blackwood Vale with his friends, climbing the Raven Tree Hall Weirwood, having the life a child should. His is a childhood stolen from him for the sake of power and duty, as so many are in Westeros. And I think that is Rhaenyra's biggest flaw in this scene. More than failures at using her royal respect and prerogatives, it's that she doesn't seem to have empathy for someone like Willem, who she shares similar kinds of burdens and lack of choice in his life. She just sees him as an insult to her personally, you know, the most important person in the room. And as to the fate of our hero, the uh, amazing, the wonderful Willem Blackwood, his victory over the fiendish Gerald Bracken will make him a hero in Blackwood Vale, but also a target for retaliation from across the Red Fork in Stonehenge. That seconds long duel between two young people in a hall far from home is going to be the spark that relights the embers of the feud between Blackwood and Bracken. As far as the Brackens are concerned, an injustice has been done, a life taken too soon, and they will want justice. When they won't get Willem's life, they'll probably ask for or take land they think belongs to them as compensation. And as this conflict escalates, both sides will probably need their house members and soldiers prepared for the ancient war their fathers fought so many times. And that means Willem Blackwood is probably being put right back on the front lines of a future battle because when he was barely a teenager, he accidentally killed Bracken in a heated moment. My guess is that his character will be name dropped in the future of the show. Perhaps a grown up Willem wearing Blackwood armor at the front of a battle as a symbol of pride for his house. Maybe being called the Slayer of Brackens or something heroic sounding. Maybe he'll get lucky again and he'll kill some Brackens to score points for his team. Or maybe he'll end up like so many others do during this time. A feast for the crows. Although this is not the end of the Blackwoods. They are one of the most fascinating houses in all of Westeros and House of the Dragon. The actions of their future sons, like Brynden Rivers to Bloodraven, shape the entire future from his weirwood throne. In House of the Dragon specifically, they should make a robust showing alongside Willem Blackwood with the likes of Bloody Benjicott, Red Rob Rivers, and Black Alley joining the cast. If you want to learn more, and trust me you do, I have a playlist here of the streams I made detailing their history from the ancient times of their founding, Age of Heroes, Aegon's Conquest, all the way to the current time in the War of the Five Kings. If you're a devoted Blackwood fan or maybe a new one, definitely check it out. You will thank me when the Blackwoods show up and you can dazzle everyone else with your knowledge of the Lords of Blackwood Vale. And I want to thank everyone for watching, especially my very many lovely patrons at patreon.com slash joemagician. And also make sure to check out my after show streams after every every House of the Dragon episode at 10.15 p.m. Eastern Time. Bye for now.